Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Mike Avery has covered the outdoors in Michigan for more than four decades, and that tradition continues today. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay Sporting Goods, the Yider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, Primal Outdoors, Security Credit Union, Offshore Tackle, Garber Chevrolet, Rapid River Knife Works, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Well, thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction, and welcome to another edition of the Outdoor Magazine radio show here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network on more than 30 radio stations across the great state of Michigan, and so glad to have you along with us. I'm always glad to have you along with us, right? I sit here every week for three hours, and every week I say, thanks for joining me, and I mean it. Because I couldn't do this without you. And this weekend is kind of an exciting weekend, is it? Isn't it? Because Sunday is October 1st. What does October 1st mean? It means this, the month of Rocktober is kicking off. Why do I call it Rocktober? Because I feel like in some ways, in many ways, it's the best month of the year. Now, I like June. I like July because I like my walleye fishing. But there's something about the month of Rocktober that is, I don't want to, <laughs> there's a word I want to use, but I won't because it's too strong. But it's a good month, isn't it? Bow season starts Sunday. Will you be out? It's going to be a little warm yet, I think. Looking at the forecast, still a little bit warm. But there's something about being out there on opening day. Now, I realize that opening day of deer season is not what opening day of deer season here in Michigan used to be. Opening day of deer season used to be November 15th, and that was it. That was the opener. We didn't have these early seasons. We didn't have the youth hunt. We didn't have the independence hunt. We didn't have the early doe season. We didn't have, well, we did have a bow season, but nobody hunted it when I was a kid. So November 15th was the deer season opener. These days, the opener has been kind of diluted, right? Because we have all these other seasons and we have bow season. I will be out there. You know, here's something. I was thinking that the opener, I was thinking October 1st was Monday. So when my grandson Trent says, hey, Grandpa, are you going to hunt the opener? I'm like, ah, I got I to gotta think about it, Trent. I don't, I don't know. And then dummy me looked at a calendar and realized that Sunday was October 1st. I got back in touch with Trent. I said, Trent, I can't hunt Sunday morning because I'll be in church. But yes, Sunday night, I can go. Let's, let's go. So Sunday night, I will be out there uh, with my grandson, Trent. Now, listen, he's 21 years old. We're not sitting in the same stand. I'm not sitting over his shoulder. I don't even know where he's going to be on the property yet. But yes, I will be out there uh, Sunday evening enjoying this celebration of our hunting heritage. I will be out there with a crossbow. I know. I know. The devil's tool. The poacher's tool. The lazy man's tool. Well, if you think that, you're a tool. In my humble opinion. Well, not so humble, actually. Listen, I, I, I have some very strong thoughts on this. Because I have bow hunted with just about every tool you can use for bow hunting, I guess other than a slingshot or a spear, and I don't even know if those are legal. I think whatever tool keeps you in the outdoors or out in the woods, great, embrace it. My most rewarding hunts have been with a recurve. I love hunting with a recurve. It is pure. It is basic. It is instinctive. It is beautiful. But man, you've got to be dedicated to it. You have to be willing to put in your time to practice. 
I mean, a lot of time. And I'm... And, I don't want to say I don't have the time to do that because if I really wanted to, I could make the time. But I'm not willing to put the time into it anymore to be proficient enough to have the confidence of having that in my hand when I go out in the woods in pursuit of game. And I think that all hunters want to be proficient and have that confidence. So a couple of years ago, when I realized at the end of the season, when a doe walked in front of me and I didn't really know if I should shoot her or not. Okay, Avery, it's time to put the recurve down. Now I could have gone back to a compound. I hunted with a compound for many years, but I went right back to the crossbow. I've hunted with a crossbow a lot. I like crossbows. Is it easier to be accurate and proficient with a, a, a crossbow than it is with a recurve or a longbow? Of course it is. Is it easier to be proficient with a crossbow than it is a compound? Of course it is. Do you have an advantage with a crossbow over a compound? Of course you do. Not because your distance is longer, not because you can make an accurate shot longer, because I don't believe ethically you can make a longer shot with a crossbow than you can with a compound. But with a crossbow, the thing is cocked, right? You've got it in your hands and it is ready to shoot. So you don't have the, the uh, activity of drawing the bow like you do with a recurve or a crossbow. So I like them. What I don't like is people who gripe about other hunters who decide to use a crossbow. What does it matter to you if I use a crossbow? What does it matter to you if, some, if anybody uses a crossbow? Well, you're taking the easy way out. It's a lazy man's way. It's a poacher's tool. It's not a poacher's tool. If I was going to go out and intentionally shoot a buck after dark like poachers do, I'd probably use a 22 mag. But that's just me, right? If I was a poacher, I wouldn't take a crossbow. Crossbows allow people to be more proficient and more accurate. Isn't that what we want our hunters to be, proficient and accurate? If you are going to let an arrow fly, don't you want to know that you have a reasonable chance of making a quick, clean, humane killing shot? And if a crossbow allows people to do that, or if a crossbow allows people to have a sore shoulder to be out there, or a crossbow allows people to be older who are out there, but you know what? I don't care if you're 25 years old and you decide you want to use a crossbow. Have at it. If that is the tool you are comfortable with, if that is the tool that will allow you to be a better hunter, have at it. And it's nobody's business that that's what you've chosen to use. Drives me crazy. Drives me crazy. And because, <laughs> because I posted a picture the other day while I was sighting my crossbow in, and I got some of those comments. Oh, why don't you just pick up a gun? Oh, really? Are you that dumb that you think a crossbow and a gun are the same type of tool? Well, Fred Bear never would have used a crossbow. Fred Bear didn't like crossbows. Do you know that for a fact? Do you know that Fred Bear didn't like crossbows? Did you talk to Fred? Did you ask him this? Because guess what? I did. The first time I ever saw a crossbow was at Grouse Haven in the mid-80s with Fred Bear. Now, Fred was not shooting a crossbow, but his people were there, and they had crossbows on the range, and they were looking at him, and they were experimenting with him, and they were talking about him, and Fred Bear was looking over their shoulders, going, this is an interesting tool. So don't tell me Fred Bear was against crossbows. Because I know for a fact he was not. Whatever gets you out there, my friends. <sighs> And I'll be out there. I will be out there. Am I as intense as I used to be? Absolutely not. But I will be out there celebrating the activity of deer hunting in Michigan because it's gone, it's gone on for generations, and I want to continue 
that activity, that passion, that pursuit, and that tradition with whatever legal tool allows me to do that. Coming up on this week's Outdoor Magazine radio show, after the break, Steve Hearing talking about a group called Benefit for Kids. Now, this is a group that their, their goal is to get kids in the outdoors and enjoy hunting and fishing. Then Scott Safransky of Linwood Beach Marina talks about the process of putting your boat away. My angler quest is still sitting there in the slip. I should have put it away a month ago because I knew I wasn't going to be out there. Now I've got to figure out how to take care of it. Tom Campbell of Woods and Water News talks about the big outdoor weekend. Then Mike Stewart, an audiologist, talks about shooting and hearing loss. I am sad to say that I have finally had to pull the trigger on hearing aids because of being young, being stupid when I was younger. Uh, Nick Green of MUCC this week's Ask Avery segment. In our third hour, Jerry Widener, one of the guys behind the hunter safety system. These are the guys who made tree stand safety, tree stand safety cool. And of course, we'll wrap it all up with wild game chef extraordinaire, Dixie Dave Miner. My name is Mike Avery. My website is MikeAveryOutdoors.com. My email address is Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. I'd love to hear from you. Don't hesitate to reach out. Glad you're with us this week right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show on more than 30 stations across the great state of Michigan, including WZTK in Alpena. That's 105.7 FM. You can hear us in Battle Creek on WBCK 95.3 FM. And you can hear us north of the bridge in Iron Mountain on WMIQ 1450 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Boning Archery. Boning a leader in the archery industry for more than three quarters of a century. The company started with Roland Boning, who invented a, a product, he was a chemist, invented a product called Ferrolite to, to uh, glue broadheads to what were at the time, what, uh, aluminum, maybe even wood, wooden arrow shafts. These days, Boning continues to innovate, come up with new products, I think blazer veins, new manufacturing processes. And as you head into the uh, archery woods this fall, or, or, or the uh, target range, uh, I bet you have boning products on your rig. If not, I would encourage you to check them out. The website, boning.com, B-O-H-N-I-N-G, boning.com, a great Michigan company. You know I love that. So a, a, a lot of what this show is about is encouraging people to get outdoors, hunting and fishing, shooting and trapping, to continue this history and tradition of doing just that. I, I think there's something very special about this outdoor experience. I think Steve Hearing probably agrees with me on that. He is with a group called Benefit for Kids, and he's with us now in the Outdoor Magazine uh, phone line. Steve, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for reaching out and letting me know that you guys are out there. Tell me about the group. What are you all about? Uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. Uh, Benefit for Kids, um, actually, we were founded in 1998, uh, some 25 years ago this year. And we are a Michigan-based organization that was formed by a bunch of sportsmen and women uh, to provide outdoor wishes to terminally ill and life-limited children. And uh, we're based right here in Michigan, so um, that's where our heart is. As you know, uh, there's so many outdoor opportunities in this state um, for hunting and fishing and, and hiking and, and just so many things that this state has to offer. Uh, it's provided us with a lot of opportunity to help kids enjoy Michigan outdoors. At one time, groups that were providing hunting trips for kids came under attack because people said, oh, you know, you're, you, you, can't, you can't do something like that. You can't, you know, put a kid in that situation. Have you taken any grief over something like that, Steve? 
Well, um, I think originally uh, our organization was founded because of other organizations that would not get kids uh, out hunting and fishing. So it was a it was a need that we saw and a, a passion uh, to do something like this to get these kids the opportunity to to hunt and fish. Um, and as you well know, we're, we're still under some of attack for that. So how do you choose the kids? How do you find the kids that you want to work with? Do they find you or do you find them? Well, um, they, they typically find us, but of course we have a lot of supporters and they are passing the word all the time, which is the reason that uh, I'm on the show with you today is because not to raise money, but to raise awareness. Uh, because out there in the listening audience today, you have a lot of folks who know someone, uh, some child who does have a life-limiting disability or terminal illness that could really use this wish. So we, we usually find um, folks through those programs. We go to a lot of shows. And then also we have our website, uh, b4k.org, benefit, uh, benefit for Kids. It's b4k.org. I'm looking at the website right now. Be the number four, b4k.org. There's a couple of buttons on top. Donate now. And the other one is a wish application. What, I'm going to click on that. Tell me what this is all about, the wish application, Steve. Okay. Well, our, our program is really simple. Uh, if uh, the child uh, is 17 years old or younger at the time of the application, they have a life-limiting or terminal illness and have not been granted another outdoor wish. And there are other uh, organizations that do provide wishes, but specifically an outdoor wish. Uh, then, then they can qualify. Uh, simply filling out that form online, uh, sending it to us or emailing us at the uh, email address info at b4k.org. Um, our board of directors will review that application, contact the family, discuss any questions, and then the uh, the board the board will vote on on that application and and communicate with the family and get that set up. What's the timetable? Because if you've got a kid who is in serious trouble, um, you know you don't want you don't want to wait a long time to get this done. What's the timetable? Absolutely. Well, as soon as we get that application. Uh, we start working on it. Uh, typically, there's no delay. Now, we've had situations where uh, that wish needed to take place, like right now. And uh, we've been really good about uh, being able to respond right away and get something set up. And where, how do you find the people who are going to take these kids out on these hunting trips or these fishing trips, where does that pool, where does that resource come from? Well, uh, having 25 years of experience doing this has allowed us to have a lot of contacts. Um, we have a lot of groups of people that um, say, anytime you've got a kid, let us know, and we'll, we'll get them out hunting or we'll get them out fishing. Um, We've had other groups that have provided, you know, horseback riding trips or um, whitewater rafting, and and so we have a lot of contacts out there to get these pro get these uh, outdoor wishes set up. So you're not looking for hunting and angling groups to take these kids out. You're looking for kids to take out. Absolutely. Now, some of these Absolutely. kids, I got to believe, are, are there's going to be some physical challenges you're going to have to deal with. I suspect. Yes. Yes, um, there are. Um, we've had, we've worked with a lot of outfitters who specifically can help kids with disabilities. So getting a child out in a wheelchair into a blind is something that's uh, becoming more and more common. Um, we work with another group, a wheeling uh, sportsman, uh, uh, wheeling team 457, and right now they actually have a child in a wheelchair that's going to be going to uh, a ranch in the in the thumb and we're partnering up with them trying to help them uh, you know with the financial part of this as well 
it's got to be um, an intense and an emotional experience, I would suspect, when you get these kids out there. It is. Uh, I'd say that's probably what hooked me in the first place is I actually met some kids at a banquet um, nearly 20 years ago. And it was something that I thought, hey, this is a great way to be able to give something back. You know, I take for granted very easily about getting out in the outdoors. You know, we hop in our boats. I, I have a lot of dogs I run for birds and I'm chasing these dogs. And, you know, you take a lot of this for granted. And, uh, and you know, when you step back and you take a look, you say, wow, you know, I, this is something that I can give back. And uh, we've got a huge group of supporters who believe that exact same thing. And so that's allowed us to continue this as an all-volunteer organization for, for 25 years. 25 years. You had to be one of the, well, you say one of the early groups out there doing this. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we have, and, and we're very unique because nobody gets paid uh, this is just an all-volunteer effort, um, so it takes a lot of uh, people uh, to make that work. The the um, kids that you end up working with, I'm just curious, are these kids primarily from families who are outdoor-oriented families, or are these kids who who come from families that are not hunters and anglers, but they've, but they've seen this and said, you know, this is something I'd like to try while I still can? Yeah, I think it's a, a mixture of that, Mike. Um, we, we do have families that are not hunting and fishing families. Um, and then that's allowed us to, to come up with other types of, of wishes. Um, some really fun zoo encounters that have a lot of other activities around those where they go behind the scenes or, um, or RV adventures. Um, so we've, we've been able to come up with other outdoor activities that, maybe non-hunter and fishermen, you know, uh, would do. Um, but we've also been able to bring a lot of kids from other states to Michigan to enjoy this resource. And as you know, being in this industry, you run across a lot of, of outfitters who really want to give back. And so we, we have a group of those here in Michigan that, that are always stepping up to the plate. Well, again, I'm looking at the website, b4k.org, b4k.org, and it says on this wish, wish application, a sick or dying child should never have to settle for second best on their wish. That's a pretty strong statement, Steve, and the fact that you guys have been doing this for so long, uh, I, I applaud you guys. Now, I, And also, you said you're not looking for money, but on this website, b4k.org, next to the wish application button, there is a, there is a button that says donate now. Now, you guys can't do this without some financial help, and I would encourage people, if they're listening to this and feel so uh, feel compelled to do so, to click on that Donate Now button. That's got to help, too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's because of our supporters. Uh, none of us are, are rich. Um, we, we do this out of our own pockets. However, the actual wishes, they come from this great group of supporters. Uh, that we have, and, and we're so blessed by being around these folks. And these are outdoorsmen and women, so you know from being in this industry, there's not a more generous group of people out there. Well, I agree with you there. Again, the uh, organization is Benefit for Kids, the website b4k.org, b4k.org. Steve, you guys are doing great work. I appreciate you reaching out. Uh, keep it up, and uh, let's you and I stay in touch. Okay, thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure's mine. Steve Hearing of Benefit for Kids, B4K.org. What higher calling could there be than taking a kid who's really in, you know, in trouble out on some hunting or fishing adventure, something that he dreamed about for a while, he or she never thought they'd be able to, and this group comes up and helps Help them accomplish that. B4K.org. B4K.org. We'll take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine Show. When we come back, we'll talk with Scott Safransky of Linwood Beach Marina, and we'll wrap up the hour with Tom Campbell from Woods and Water News.
You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Cairo on WKYO, 1360 AM, WIDL, 92.1 FM. You can hear us in Sandusky on WMIC, 660 AM, 95.3 FM. And you can hear us north of the bridge in Marquette on WDMJ, 1320 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by Versa Skins. Just change your skin for the season you're in. Why buy a bunch of different sets of hunting clothes when you can buy one good quality set and snap on and zip on an outer shell of a different camo pattern? Check them out online at VersaSkins.com. That's VersaSkins.com. While you are online, I would encourage you to check out my website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com, and also head on over to LinwoodBeachMarina.com. LinwoodBeachMarina.com, of course, the website of Linwood Beach Marina, one of my favorite places in the great state of Michigan. Scott Safransky is uh, with Linwood Beach and on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Scott, welcome back to the show. How are you? Good, Mike. Thank you. Hey, listen, you guys, it looks like you guys had a lot of fun there last weekend with a uh, Halloween party for the kids. Uh, uh, You're always doing something fun out there. Good job. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we had a great great event, Mike. We had two... 200 250 kids and uh brought in a magician and uh balloon tying bounce houses um hay ride um food uh hot dogs and then uh, finally uh uh the kids kind of migrate out to the uh campground to do some trick-or-treating it was a great event there's always something fun going on at linwood beach how is the fishing out there right now scott uh, well, Mike, what we're looking at right now is uh, kind of a stabilized perch. You know, perch has been hit, hit and miss a little bit, but it's been uh, it's been getting it's been getting good. Eighteen to twenty one feet of water. You know, out in front of the marina, um, we've been seeing some uh, some boats kind of anchoring up out there from shore here, and uh, it's been pretty good. Well, fall uh, fall yeah, walleye fishing. fishing no, walleye fishing. We're still waiting on um, for the migration back. Uh, there's been some fish being caught in some deeper water north of us. Uh, but uh, we're probably still a few, a few weeks away from that. Well, that, that fall fishing that's coming up, though, Scott, I, 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 I'm always missing the boat, pun intended. I know that I should keep my angler quest in the water to take advantage of that fall fishing. But I'll be honest with you, I get busy on other things, and I never do. I, I, I should have brought my boat over to you guys weeks ago to get it ready for the, for the uh, winter storage season. What, what is involved in that, Scott, and why should we bring our boat to somebody like you to have it done professionally? Well, the main thing is that when you get a trained eye, you know, looking for stuff that uh, could cause you potential problems, um, you know, but normally it's going to start with uh, uh, most outboards nowadays that we're dealing with are, are four strokes, so uh, engine oil and filter change uh, every hundred hours or at the very minimum, every fall during your normally scheduled uh, layup, and then a gear lube change um, is very important. And, um, you know, the, the important thing with the gear lube change is taking a look and seeing if there's any signs of uh, gear wear or moisture um, because uh, and corrosion, you know, so that the corrosion can attack the gear set and the bearings, and, uh, and that's one thing. And then at the water trapped inside the lower units even worse which can freeze and damage the casting during the winter so um and on top of that getting the fuel stabilized existing fuel that's in the fuel tank um and running uh stabilized fuel through the system and it's important that the engines run up to normal operating temperature when we do this so um so it's it's uh it, it's just important to have it's important to do it first of all and uh well and when you have a trained tech doing it you know we're we're normally looking for you know uh other things you know signs of wear on belts and uh, uh things of that nature well and, and your guys do this every day if if we you know you can this is a process that if you know what you're doing you can do it on your own however it's something that you would do once a year um, you're not going to be you're not going to be as good at it as your people who do it a you know multiple times a day dozens if not hundreds of times throughout the season. Yes, and and that's true. And uh, and a lot of people don't realize, like on your boat, you know, you have that wash down system. You know, the, your deck wash down. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's important to get uh, um, you know some antifreeze into those water systems to, to prevent freeze and break. So that's advice that we can give people. And then you know, just keeping them on the right track. You know, it's money well spent. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, what about shrink wrapping, storage? Do you guys do that type of thing, Scott? 
Yep, yep. We have indoor uh, uh, cold storage uh, that we offer, and then uh, we offer uh, uh, shrink wrap uh, services too. So shrink and store. You know, shrink and leave it here on the on the property for the winter. Yeah, well, I'm kind of I'm kind of liking those options. I I don't want to I don't want to admit that my fishing season is over, but I was thinking it. I I, I got a bunch of friends out there who have angler quests in the water, and they're going to have them in the water till it freezes up. So if I want to go fishing, I can still come out to Linwood Beach and take advantage of that. Oh, you sure can. And, uh, you know, and, and I understand that, you know, even though lots of people are heading to the woods, um, you know, we still have lots of good fishing here. And, uh, you know, whether it's on someone's angler quest or you've spoken with Jason at uh, Send to Charters before. Mm-hmm. Uh, last year, Jason was running trips December, January. Um, you know, we never did really freeze up. And, uh, you know, those without boards, those people without boards can extend their season into those cold weather months. And, uh, and, and you can experience some awesome fishing. You know that. Oh, absolutely. And Jason. Jason is a fishing machine. How long will the uh, launches, how long will the ramps be open this fall, Scott? Well, we were just uh, joking about that the other day. I'd say last year we pulled and put back in our launch ramps four to five times because <laughs> obviously the basin you know, can uh, skim over with ice and freeze up a little bit with the offshore water still being uh, open. Uh, so when, you know, when, when it looks like we're going to get a little harder freeze, we'd pull them out. And then when it thawed back out, you know, we'd push them back in for people so they could get out and, um, and, uh, and get some fishing done. So, uh, you know, we just kind of roll with the, you know, we just roll with the punches and, you know, I was, um, you know, on my phone looking at some weather forecast yesterday in this El Nino forecast that they're calling for is, is calling for some warmer winter temps this year. Perfect. All right, Scott, listen, I got to let you go. Scott Safranski of Linwood Beach Marina, linwoodbeachmarina.com. Great facilities, great people, great location. What more could you ask? You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Sheboygan on Big Country Gold, WCBY, 1240 AM, 100.7 FM. You can hear us in Flint on Sports Extra, 1330 WTRX. And north of the bridge in Newberry, WNBY, 1450 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Killer Food Plots. Now, I know you're probably done putting your food plots in now. And that's good. But, you know, just keep these guys in mind. Rich Krasan at Killer Food Plots does a great job in helping you to uh, develop your property, to hold wildlife on your property, um, to putting in food plots. Uh, and some of the stuff they do is pretty sophisticated. Check them out online at KillerFoodPlots.com. That's KillerFoodPlots.com. I want to turn our attention now to the good folks at Woods and Water News, Michigan's premier outdoor publication. And I say that intentionally. In Michigan... You know, th- this, is, this is a hot bed of outdoor recreation, hunting and fishing and shooting and trapping. So as a result, it's kind of a hot bed of outdoor writers, outdoor publications. But I think Woods and Water News is right there at the top of the list. Tom Campbell, uh, one of the reasons for that with us now on the Outdoor Magazine uh, phone line. Tom, welcome back. How you doing, buddy? Just great, Mike. Thank you for those kind words. That's really nice of you to say. Well, sure. and, 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 and I, I mean it, but we haven't had a chance to yeah. talk since the big outdoor weekend. Because. I was so disappointed. Um, I, I was tied up at Jay's with their uh, anniversary sale. Right. Plus, right. Saturday sure. was the youth hunt. The DNR yeah, yeah, didn't do us yeah. any favors by moving that youth <laughs> hunt up a week. <laughs> no, so I didn't get did. to come down and see, but by all accounts, it was a great success. Yes, yeah, it was, Mike. It worked out real nice, and we're so pleased, and we appreciate your help promoting it for sure because uh, – and everything helps, that's for sure. And uh, the weather held out. It was cooled off for us. Got everybody kind of in the mood. And and the uh, the outdoor weekend went real well. The vendors looked really great. Man, it was so nice to see everybody back with, with inventory and product and and uh, smiles and people talking and, and finding out the latest. So everything, uh, yeah, everything went real well. So do and, you? Uh, we recovered enough to get the October issue out as well, <laughs> Mike. So. Well, that that was my next question. Do you get a chance to breathe now? But I know you really don't. <laughs> Not much. No. Now we're uh, actually, as we speak, we're we're heart, in the heart of that November issue, getting getting it ready to go to the printer. So, but yeah, the October issue came out a, a few days right after the outdoor weekend, and uh, a week later, and everybody should have found it on their favorite newsstand or in the mailbox. How how far? 
in advance do you work, Tom? Because I look at this like me with this show, I work like a, like a day in advance. I, you don't have that luxury, do you? <laughs> well, yeah, sometimes we do. We actually do. But, you know, it, it is nice with, as you mentioned at the intro there with, with our great outdoor writers, you know, if there's uh, stories and articles and things that are, are not timing and, and we've got them in advance, you know, uh, we get an extra hour here or there. We'll, I'll go through them and we'll put them on the page. You have them ready to go and just all filed up. So you, you can get a head start on a few things. But, you know, as everything, it's like you said, the last last couple of days is where everything comes together. And, and you got to make sure there's no mistakes. <laughs> well, <laughs> is, 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 is that even possible when you have that yeah, many words boy. in print? Aren't you going right. to have uh, somewhere <laughs> there's going to be a misspelling or something right somewhere there's going to be a camera yeah yeah and i'll tell you this mike somebody out there will find it <laughs> and they will let us know of course, that's fine. Of course they will <laughs> <laughs> that's fine oh man so what about the october issue what are, what, what, what are you going to see oh, in there I, I tell you we've got a great story daryl kedort interviewed a gentleman that for since he was 19 years old has been hunting the up and uh, it's fantastic, uh, the, you know, the reflection to look back, to hear him describe what the UP was back then and how, you know, it, they would go up a week before to make camp. And it's just a, a good old fashioned uh, a reflection story. And, uh, and I want to make sure everybody knows that's in there because it's worth the, the $4 for that story alone. But on top of that, well, you know, we're covering fall fishing. Mark Martin's all over the fall walleye. Um, uh, Mark Romack's got a fantastic uh, story on modern waterfall tactics. You know, some things you got to do now because it's not like it used to be years ago where the birds just came and landed. You know, they're getting as smart as the hunters are getting as smart. So it's some modern ideas there. And uh, we always, you know, uh, we always try to get lots of information in there. One good thing that we always try to do is get uh, deer tracker information in there. If you happen to get a deer down, but you can uh, have trouble finding it, uh, we've got a list of all the dog deer trackers in the state of Michigan uh, available, in the, and it's in the October issue as well. So all kinds of great stuff. Well, you know, you talked about how you talk about how things have changed and evolved, and, and you guys at, at Woods and Water News have been so good at changing and evolving with that, and that's really been one of the keys, hasn't it, Tom? Yeah, it has. You're right, Mike. Yep, uh, we're a little, you know, old fashioned on the technology. We still believe, you know, print sells and print. Uh, people still love print, and and. By the way, they buy it in the subscription. <laughs> they still do like to have that physical product in their hands. So on that part of technology, it seems like we're behind. But yet at the same time, I think it's working for a lot of people. Oh, I think I think it's <laughs> worked very, very well. Tom, keep up the good work. Congrats on a successful Thanks, uh, outdoor weekend. And you and I will talk again in a couple of weeks. Right, fantastic. Tom Take Campbell care. of Woods and Water News. The website woods-n-waternews.com, woods-n-waternews.com. We'll take a break for the top of the hour. When we come back shooting and hearing loss what what shooting and hearing you heard me shooting and hearing loss and more coming up in hour two of this week's outdoor magazine now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Mike Avery has covered the outdoors in Michigan for more than four decades, and that tradition continues today. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay Sporting Goods, the Yider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, Primal Outdoors, Security Credit Union, Offshore Tackle, Garber Chevrolet, Rapid River Knife Works, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Well, thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction, and welcome to our number two of this week's Outdoor Magazine radio show. Here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network on more than 30 radio stations across the great state of Michigan. And I do believe if you can... 
the best way to listen to Outdoor Magazine is on your local radio station. Uh, For one thing, the local radio stations get the content of the show before the podcast version is uploaded. Now, listen, podcasting is hot. Everybody's got a podcast, and that's great. That's wonderful. Podcasting is cool. I love podcasting. And that's why I make the radio show available as a podcast if your local radio station doesn't carry all three hours of the show or if you live in some part of our state not covered by the broadcast signal. You can hear the podcast version of the show um, Sunday evenings. I have it uploaded by Sunday evenings. You can hear it on my website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. It's on my Facebook page, Amazon, Audible, Twitter, which is now called X, uh, LinkedIn, Apple Music, Google Play, uh, SoundCloud, Spotify, yada, 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 yada. I also put a version up on YouTube. I know it doesn't make any sense. There's no, there's no video to it, but it's on YouTube, and people watch slash listen to it every week. Um, but like I say, I, I do like podcasting. Um, In fact, each month I produce podcasts for some of my uh, broadcast partners, including Offshore Tackle, Angler Quest uh, Boats, Polar Craft Boats, and Primal Outdoors. And in fact, let's see, by the time you hear this radio show, the latest Primal Outdoors podcast uh, will be online. Uh, David Blanton of Realtree, one of the biggest names in the outdoor industry today, is joining me on that podcast, so I would ask you to keep an ear out for that. Well, speaking of ears, that was an interesting segue there, unintentional. I've, uh, I've had to make an admission of my own age in the last little while here. And it's my hearing. My hearing is not what it used to be. And I, three factors here, I suspect, age, but more importantly, shooting without hearing protection and loud music at concerts, rock concerts, when I was young and dumb and a kid. I will go back to one situation specifically. I had a friend who was a a federal agent and he had a 45. And he was carrying it on us. We were up grouse hunting. And I saw that 45. And I, at the time, I had never had a chance to shoot a 45 yet. And he had the gun. And he had a lot of ammo. And he said, you want to shoot it? I said, absolutely. So I don't know why I shot this thing without hearing protection. But I shot it and shot it and shot it and shot it. Because I love the feel of a 45. I love the nice, the nice slow push of the 45. I really enjoyed it. But I shot it a lot. And on the ride home, I thought, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Because my hearing was basically gone. I could hear sounds, but it was like muffled. It was like mush. And then my ears started to ring, and I thought, oh, boy, I'm really in trouble. Fast forward several years. Recently, I've had a real hard time hearing people in crowded rooms. And this really came to a head here three weeks ago when my daughter Shelby got married. And at the reception, I did not know what people were saying. I could see their mouth moving and I could kind of figure it out. And if I got real close to them, but I realized, you know what, Avery, you've let this thing go too far. So I finally pulled the trigger on hearing aids. I've got to thank Justin Hess at Miracle Ear over in Midland. I ended up not getting my hearing aids from him, but he's a guy who was instrumental in this. I've also got to thank Dr. Mike Stewart, an audiologist and a guy who taught at CMU for many, many years. In fact, every, uh, every audiologist I go to these days was trained by or knows Dr. Mike Stewart. Mike Stewart has been a pioneer in this area of shooting and hearing loss because as a trained audiologist, he's also a hunter. And he's with us now on the Outdoor Magazine phone line to talk more about this and how you can be not stupid like Avery was and protect yourself. Mike, welcome back to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thanks for that great introduction, Mike. And you're not, it's not stupidity. It's just not knowing uh, the consequences. And more people are starting to realize that. And hopefully we'll make some headway in that area and we have less noise-induced hearing loss from firearm noise. Well, this this is this is something you've been preaching for years, though, Mike. How did how did you get involved in all this? Well, I uh, 
when I started to become an audiologist I, I, uh, at Western Michigan University way back in the 70s, I took my first hearing test and I couldn't believe how much high frequency hearing loss I had lost. And it was a typical hunter's audiogram with the left ear being worse than the right ear because that's a gun blast ear for people who shoot long guns on their right shoulder, which most people do. And uh, I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that I had lost that much hearing. I was almost a hearing aid candidate at that time. Luckily, I started to wear hearing protection after that, and I haven't lost any more hearing. But as I'm getting older, you know, your ability to fill in and cognitive ability and all that go down, and so the hearing loss starts to become more evident. And, uh, I, I have a very difficult loss to fit because I have fairly normal hearing through most of the uh, important speech frequencies, but then it drops off sharply and have basically no hearing after that, no hearing to amplify. So uh, I'm glad that you are getting hearing aids, and I've been after you for years. I, I, I hope it works out for you because I think you will like it. And you, like you said, you go to a reception and you can't hear anything. How much fun is that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I don't. I, it's not going to solve all your problems, but I, I'm sure. And please keep me posted on this because I'd like to know how how you're doing with them. Yeah, I, I will. And, I, and, you know, like I say, I really I owe you a debt of gratitude for even getting me thinking along this line. But and, and I'm not unique, I don't think, here, Mike. Oh, no, no. You're, uh, this is how it always goes down. Usually is uh, the spouse brings the, usually the, the man in and said, please help this guy. He can't hear. And then, you know, the response is, well, you mumble. And, you know, it, it sets up a whole, uh, you know, family dynamics issue. But uh uh, and people don't really want to wear hearing aids, but once they get into them, they realize, hey, these things really do work, and they're much better today than they were when I started my my uh, career. You're right. I, I don't want to wear them. Uh, for one thing, it's a vanity thing. I don't want to make the admission that I'm getting older. Uh, I, I don't have them yet, so I can't, you know, but I, I, I think they're going to be clunky. I think they're going to, I don't know. I just, I'm not looking forward to it, but it got to the point where, I had to do something, and I blame myself. This could have been prevented, right? Yeah, definitely. And that's uh, the case so almost always with noise-induced hearing loss, whether it's from factory noise or motorcycle noise or or firearm noise or any loud noise. It's always preventable if you if you wear hearing protection, protect yourself. So what what does this do? When, when you get a, a gun blast, what does that do to your ears? Well, it uh, vibrates the inner hair cell or the inner hair cells uh, so much that uh, they become displaced from the membrane they're on. Uh, and after years and years of shooting, you just keep chipping away uh, at that, uh, um, in, in the, in especially in the higher frequency range. And by the time you realize it, uh, you know, you're already a hearing aid candidate. So it... it it accumulates over time, but I also think you've told me stories in the past about uh, you had kids come in that had one specific incident, like a gun right. going off inside of a blind. So it can be either or, right? right? It, it could be either or or a combination of it. You could be losing your hearing uh, gradually over the years and then exposed to uh, you know, a very dangerous situation and lose more of it quickly. So. Uh, but it, it's it's really a combination of both, especially if you've been shooting for a long time. Uh, you you know you will start to lose hearing in the high frequency range. Uh, we did a a test uh, a couple of years ago, and it was published in a professional journal uh, about uh, kids uh, shooting. Uh, and uh, most of these kids had very normal hearing through most of the frequency range, but all, in the ultra high frequency range, twelve thousand, fourteen thousand, sixteen thousand hertz which doesn't affect your ability to understand speech, we were starting to pick up, uh, you know, quite a bit of hearing loss in that region. And the left ear was <laughs> worse than the right ear. So they were already, uh, and these were 12 to 17-year-old children, uh, they were already uh, getting the effects of, uh, uh, of high-frequency hearing loss. And if they keep shooting, then it just keeps creeping into the lower frequencies, and finally speech becomes muffled. Because mm. you lose the high frequency consonant sounds, and uh, they are the ones that produce the clarity 
and the vowels produce the loudness. So you can hear vowels fine because your hearing is usually normal in that range, but in the high frequency range, uh, you don't you have a hearing loss, and so you don't hear the consonant sounds as well. And it sounds like people are mumbling, and that's why people accuse. Well, it's not me; it's you. Uh, have you been? Did you plant a microphone in my house, Mike? Because I feel like you, I feel like you've been hearing the conversations in the Avery household. We're talking with Doctor oh, Mike just... Stewart. <laughs> Hang tight, Mike. We got to take a break. We're talking with Doctor Mike Stewart, an audiologist, a very well-known uh, audiologist and a hunter as well, and he's done a lot of research into this concept of shooting and hearing loss. And the heck of it is, this can be prevented. I mean, if had I done things differently years ago, I wouldn't be getting ready to put hearing aids in my ears next week and i'm not really looking forward to it so that's why we're having this conversation right so maybe you can learn and prevent it more with mike stewart after the break right here on outdoor magazine You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Houghton Lake on the Twister 92.1 WTWS. You can hear us in uh, St. Joe on WSJM 94.9 FM. And you can hear us north of the bridge in the Sioux on News Talk 1400 WKNW. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by... That sound right there. Rapid River Knife Works. That's the sound of my Rapid River Knife opening. You know I carry this knife in my pocket all the time. In fact, I, um, I called the folks at Rapid River the other day, and I ordered a knife for a friend of mine. I don't want to say too much more because I want it to be a surprise. But Now, had I been going up to the UP, I would have just stopped by their showroom on US2, just east of Rapid River. It's a beautiful place. If you are up there, in fact, it's worth a drive. The showroom is beautiful. It's filled with uh, uh, great mounts of big game animals. Um, you can see all the different knives on display. You can watch them make knives. You can buy a knife. You can have them engraved right there in front of you. I'm telling you, it's, <laughs> a knife is one of the most valuable tools I think a person can have, and Rapid River are some of the best knives out there. If you can't make it to the showroom, go to the website rapidriverknifeworks.us, rapidriverknifeworks.us, and you will see what I mean. Talking now with uh, Dr. Mike Stewart, who is an audiologist who has done an awful lot of research in this concept, uh, on this concept of shooting and hearing loss. Mike, have you have you determined over the years that are there certain types of guns or calibers or something that are more, um, that do more damage than others? Oh, yeah. The, uh, you know, the, the bigger the bore, the shorter the bullet, or shorter the bore or uh, barrel, the uh, the more powder, the, the bigger the boom. So, you know, like you were talking about that 45, was that a 45 ACP or a 45 long coat? ACP. Yeah, well, you're lucky it wasn't a 45 long coat because that's quite a bit louder because uh, this guy has a bigger bullet, more powder, and uh, they're all short barrels. And so, yeah, you want to stay away from... Uh, Short barreled guns, uh, uh, especially large uh, uh, caliber, you know, uh, that uh, even though the large calibers are, are really popular, uh, but uh, they are more dangerous. And uh, the shorter the barrel, the closer it is to your ear. Uh, I would advise you to use a, a single shot or bolt action rather than a semi automatic, which can, you know, fire uh, several shots quickly. Uh, so there's a lot of things that go into the gun, uh, but the most important thing you can do is put a suppressor on the end of the barrel. You know, we've we've talked about this before. It, it seems like such a such a common sense thing to do, but <clears throat> still at this point, Mike, it's such a hassle to get a suppressor. Yeah, well, it is. You know, you're looking at about a year wait if you if you uh, try to use the paper form to apply for a suppressor. But you can cut that down to about five or six months if you use the e-form. Hmm. Uh, if you're 21 years old and a U.S. resident and have no felony record, it should go right through. Uh, and you should be able to get a press suppressor, uh, you know, within within a half a year or at least uh, no longer than a year. Oh, see, I didn't, know, uh, I didn't is, even know about that hassle. process. I didn't even know about that process. Yeah. yeah, it is a hassle, but it's worth it. I've gotten two suppressors already. Oh, hopefully this will be 
become more available. We're working right now with the American Suppressor Association and trying to develop a, a standard on how to test these uh, suppressors uh, so that people know exactly what the attenuation is. Uh, but uh, hopefully, at some point, uh, we'll, we'll be able to buy these suppressors just like you were able to buy ammunition. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, it'd be really nice. And you can do that in many European countries. Surprisingly, um, you can't do it in the U.S. Uh, without going through this uh, fe- you know, federal procedure. Well, they, they ca- they've got kind of a weird, bad connotation, which doesn't make any sense at all, right? Right. Yeah, you know, they're worried that it's going to be used for criminals. But I'm telling you right now, there's not very many criminals that are going to put a suppressor on a pistol <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, try to, and try to rob a bank. I mean, you know. No, uh, you know, I, I think that that's a consideration, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's the firearm itself. It's not, you know, how it's, uh, you know, if you have a suppressor on it or not, it, uh, it's, it's the person using the gun. If, if you have a suppressor, does that eliminate the need for hearing protection, too? Uh, <laughs> uh, it certainly reduces risk. Uh, most of the suppressors that we've tested with most of the guns have provided uh, about as much attenuation as a good pair of hearing protection. Mm. 20, 20, 20 to 5 to 30 decibels of attenuation. Now, that doesn't mean we're advocating that you not wear hearing protection. We're just saying it's going to be a lot less sound pressure. It still may be dangerous depending on the the gun you're using, like a 22 with a uh, you know a suppressor, no problem. But a, a, a 450 uh, may be a problem, even with a suppressor. So we're recommending that uh, you use hearing protection, but a different type, Mike. You don't have to use the 30 dB attenuation protection anymore. You can go down to the high fidelity stuff, which is you know provides maybe 10 decibels of attenuation, or uh, the nonlinear stuff, which allows softer sounds to get through and then attenuates louder sounds. So we would say change the type of ear protection you're using uh, with your suppressor, unless, unless the gun is a, a very small caliber. Can you suppress a shotgun? Yes, you can, uh, especially with a slug. But with birdshot, it's a little bit more difficult. But you can. I've shot shotguns with suppressors on them. The problem is, is they're so unwieldy. They're about a foot long and about three or four inches in diameter. So they're much larger than most of your rifle or pistol suppressors. Uh, but yes, you can uh, use a suppressor with a shotgun, and, and they do make they do they do make suppressors for shotguns. And, and the reason I ask is that I'm not a waterfall hunter, but I got a lot of friends who are. And you know, I'm thinking when you're out there in the blind with three or four guys, and a flock comes over, that's a lot of noise generated in a short yeah. period of time. We actually published an article on that about ten years ago. With waterfall hunters, and yeah, they're at increased risk because they got not only the noise from their own gun, but noise from adjacent shooters. And usually, you got you know two or four guys in a blind all shooting at once and, you know, three shots a piece, and that's an awful lot of exposure. So I would say of all the hunters, the waterfowl hunter is probably more vulnerable for a noise-induced train loss than, than any other type of hunter. So, all right, suppressors are an option. Uh, obviously, hearing protection. There are so many different kinds out there. I mean, I, I wear, when I'm on the range now, I wear these big, unwieldy muffs that I, you know, they're headphones like I have in the radio studio right now, but they, they right. do a great job. But I don't want to wear that when I'm hunting, Mike. No, and I don't think you should because you're you know, robbing yourself of uh, important acoustic cues of, of game coming or some or one of your friends approaching from the side, and you you know you get you know you don't you don't hear the person coming, and so it startles you. Uh, you know, yeah, you you don't want to. You, you know, you 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 don't want to be wearing hearing protection in a blind. Um, I would say keep it handy, uh, and usually with deer hunting, especially, you have enough time to put the uh, the hearing protection in or put the muffs on after you spot a deer, because usually you have time to do that. But I would never say you should be sitting in a blind with with hearing protection. One of the things I was kind of disappointed to find out about hearing aids, I thought with the way technology had uh, evolved and developed these days, that I could get a hearing aid that would also serve as hearing protection. 
they said, no, we're not quite there yet. So what, so what do you recommend then? What, what should be, we be wearing? Well, you, you can. It depends on how you couple it to the ear. If you are using the open-ear RIC systems, which are very popular, and that's probably what you've been fit with, uh, then they offer very little of attenuation. But if you use a standard in-the-ear device or a behind-the-ear device with a sil- silicone mold that doesn't have a vent, then you do have hearing protection and amplification. Mm. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the, uh, the in-the-ear uh, hearing protection, electronic hearing protection, acts just like that. It's a standard in-the-ear device. looks just like a standard in-the-ear hearing aid, but it does not have a vent, so there's no sound that can get in. Uh, and it, it gives you mild gain amplification, and then when you pull the trigger, it gives you hearing protection. Mm. I see and you can saying. set up a regular hearing aid like that, but you probably wouldn't want to wear it. Uh, in a crowded condition, you, you're going to want something that's open ear, uh, especially with the type of loss that you have. You're going to want something that is not occluding and open ear, and it, it's just going to work out a lot better. Yeah, for you. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, that's what they were telling me. Pro- yeah, it doesn't protect you. So, what about these nonlinear systems I hear you talk about? Well, they're uh, engineered uh, in using the different uh, fabric and, and also uh, port holes. Uh, that allow softer sounds to get through, but as the sound becomes more intense, it attenuates. And there, uh, there's a variety of them on the market, and uh, they work very well. Uh, I would probably, uh, you know, use that type sitting in a blind if I were going to use hearing protection in a blind because it does not affect uh, low, lower level sounds. But when the sound becomes high, like a firearm noise. Uh, it attenuates, and so they, they and they're cheap. You know, ten, twelve dollars a pair. Oh, <laughs> that's that's money very well spent. That's for sure. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. So, Doc, what what have you been up to? When I when I talked to you the other day, you were up in the UP. Have you been out hunting? Yeah. Any any good adventures? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a bear hunter, Mike. I couldn't I couldn't shoot a bear because we have a black lab. <laughs> I could not. But my nephew pulled the license. <laughs> My nephew pulled a license, and we've been having bears come into our camp. We had a bear walk right through the camp last summer. And so I said, okay, we got to take some of these bears out. And so he, he came up, and, boy, we tried everything. We baited and baited and everything, and we could not get the bears to come in. I even did a honey burn. You ever hear of Yes, that? indeed. Uh, and it worked great. Man, the smoke was just rolling off that can you know and uh but it, it it did work for my friend we did one for him and he had a bear coming in the next day but it didn't work for us and we're along the Manuscon river up there we're close and we went down and looked at the river and there are so many choke cherries it's uh, just filthy with and that's what we find in the droppings of choke cherry uh, berries and so they've got so much food they're not interested in uh looking for any more man well, that makes sense. So you had a good good hunt anyway, it sounds like, I bet. Yeah, we had a lot of fun, and I tell you, that honey burn, the old bear hunter told me about that, and I couldn't believe it, but when I tried it, it was really effective <laughs> that, that. Uh, in terms of the smoke it put out. I, I, I could, Mike, after we did the burn, I went down range about 200 yards, and I could smell the honey. Yeah, yeah. So I know, I know a bear could smell it a lot farther than that. Well, Doc, uh, listen, I, I, I appreciate your help over the years and, and you know, helping me kind of move this direction i i'm sure it's a good move i i'm still reluctant to do it but i know i gotta do the hearing aid uh route but if people take your advice hopefully they can avoid it so dr uh, mike stewart always appreciate your time good hunting to you and we'll talk again yeah. okay all right mike thank you mike stewart a uh, guy who's a uh, audiologist who specializes in shooting and hearing loss because he's also a hunter we'll take a break here in the outdoor magazine show when we come back nick green of mucc checks in and we'll wrap up the hour with this week's ask avery segment right here on outdoor magazine Welcome back to Outdoor Magazine. Glad to have you along with us this week. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine radio show in Houghton Lake on 98.5 WUPS. 98.5, one of those stations we call a blowtorch. It is powerful. It reaches the entire northern uh, part of the lower peninsula. You can also hear us in Holland on WHTC, 1450 AM, 99.7 FM. And you can hear us, let's see, how about if we go north of the bridge? Let's go to Escanaba. The Riviera of the North. 
You can hear us on WCHT 600 AM, 95.3 FM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by the Linwood Beach Marina and Campground. Now, if you were with us in the first hour, you heard Scott Safransky of Linwood Beach. Uh, Scott was talking about this process of winterizing your boat. Um, I, I hate to use the term winterize, right? Let's just say preparing your boat for the end of your fishing season. And he talked about the importance of having somebody, uh, a professional do that. And that makes, that makes a lot of sense, right? But whether it's winterization, whether it's shrink wrapping, whether it's storage, or whether you're still out there enjoying the fall fishing, the great perch fishing on Saginaw Bay, the great walleye fishing, the big walleye that's coming up. The folks at Linwood Beach can uh, help you out. The uh, website, linwoodbeachmarina.com. That's linwoodbeachmarina.com. Uh, trying to get a hold of Nick Green of MUCC. Nick had told me he would be available. Something must have come up. So I also reached out to Amy Trotter, executive director of MUCC. Didn't hear back from her. And as a last minute, uh, Justin Tomei from MUCC, because I had just been talking with Justin. He sent me an email with a picture of a big, beautiful UP black bear that he took, 330-some pounds dressed. I said, please send me, send me a picture of that. He did, and <laughs> the picture of the bear, he's got it at his chest up posing, and there's a big, beautiful white V blaze. I sent him an email back. I said, Justin, that is an absolutely beautiful bear. He said, yeah. He said it was going to be a rug, until, until he uh, turned and lifted that right front shoulder and I saw the blaze, he said, then it had to be a quarter, a quarter body mount. So long story short, we don't have anybody from MUCC, and I apologize for that. I do want to go back to that conversation, though, with Dr. Mike Stewart, audiologist Dr. Mike Stewart, about shooting and hearing loss. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's it makes me feel... I don't know, kind of bad that I've got to go this route of hearing aids. And, and, and honestly, if, if I didn't get them, it's not going to be like I'm not going to be able to function in society or function in my job at all. But I, I'm, I'm hoping that it does make things better because as I, I've been knowing, <laughs> I've been realizing this for a while. When I was in a noisy environment, say a restaurant or something, even across the table, my wife, Denise, I have a hard time hearing her. Now, she has a very soft voice, and, and, and you know, guys will joke around about, yeah, I can hear everything except the sound of my wife's voice. And I, 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 I know that's a joke, but it's also kind of true because, you know, women tend to, they talk softly, and their voice is a little bit higher frequency. And so I knew I was having problems, and I've been toying with this idea of hearing aids for a long time and just didn't want to do it. But then, like I say, at my daughter's reception, and I realized that, uh, listen, I had to do something. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I don't know. The, 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 the moral of the story is it's something that can be prevented. Just wear your hearing protection. Don't be stupid. You know, just, just suppressors. I... I should have had a suppressor for my Brenton 350 Legend by now, but I don't. Now, I have, I have been around guns before when guys were shooting them with suppressors. My good friend Paul Phillips, one of the best extreme long-range shooters in the world, they don't shoot unless their gun is suppressed. He's also working, I think, with the GSL suppressor company, so he's very much involved in this. And one time I was out shooting with him, and they even had a suppressor on a twenty two. Now, you wouldn't think you would suppress a twenty two, but if you have access to them, why not? And honestly, they're not silencers, but you put a suppressor on a twenty two, it's pretty quiet. You put a suppressor on a, what was he shooting, the big bore guns? It's still, you're going to want to hearing, wear hearing protection, but it's just a lot, lot nicer. So there are ways around it. If you can't get a suppressor, at least put little, put little foam earring plugs in your ears, or, you know, earplugs in your ears. It can, be, uh, it can be avoided, and I wish I would have done that. Uh, what else is going on this weekend? Sunday, October 1st, opening day of bow season. I will be out there, uh, not in the morning. I'll be out Sunday evening. My grandson Trent said, hey, Grandpa, are you going to hunt opening day? Well, 
when I realized that opening day was on a Sunday, I said, yeah, you want to go out there Sunday night? So we're going to be out there Sunday night. I will have a crossbow in my hands. He will have his compound. And if you're hunting with a recurve, God bless you there too. I say whatever tool keeps you out there, keeps you active, allows you to enjoy the sport, allows you to be accurate, proficient, and confident, have at it. Have at it. If you want to reach out to me, if you want to contact me, the best way to do it is email Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. That's Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. Let me know what's on your mind if you agree or disagree. Also, it's a great way to send me questions for the Ask Avery segment. Speaking of Ask Avery, coming up after the break, this week's Ask Avery question, what do you do if suddenly no trespassing signs show up in your favorite hunting or fishing spot? And you think maybe that they're not legit. How do you deal with that? Now, that's a question that pops up, unfortunately, all the time. We will answer that coming up after the break. And then in hour three of this week's show, Jerry Widener of the Hunter Safety System. If you go up a tree without a full body harness, well, I think you're making a mistake. All that coming up right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Lansing on WILS, 1320 AM. You can hear us in Manistee on WMLQ, 97.7 FM. And you can hear us north of the bridge in Manistee on WTIQ, 1490 AM, 95.3 FM. The Ask Avery segment is brought to you each week by the good folks at Security Credit Union. Security Credit Union loves to work with outdoors men and women. And they can help you with your next outdoor adventure. Check them out online at securitycu.org. That's securitycu.org. And again, the best way to get these questions to me is to send me an email. Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. What the Ask Avery segment is designed to do is to give you a way to get involved in the context, the, the content of the show. If you have a question that you would like to get answered that maybe you can't get to that person or... Uh, maybe you want a question you want me to answer directly, send me an email, mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com, mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com. That is what Sam Sedinari did. Sam Sedinari sent me a, an email to mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com. He says, Mike, some no trespassing signs mysteriously appeared in front of my favorite grouse hunting spot, an area I always thought to be state land. After double-checking Onyx, and Onyx is a... Is an, is an app that you can carry on your phone that is very, very valuable that shows property lines. It shows who owns these property lines. And once I started using it, I, 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 you'll never go back. Anyway, Sam said, after double-checking Onyx and Plat Maps, is it Plat or Plot? It's Plat. Uh, Plat Maps. I determined the adjacent private landowner had either mistakenly placed them or was purposefully attempting to extend the range of their private hunting area. What is the best and quickest way to determine legitimacy of these signs while avoiding confrontation? In this case, the adjacent property landowner was not around, so a quick discussion with them was not an option. I'm also interested in the legality and fines associated with someone improperly posting state-owned land. Sam, this is a question that comes up all the time. So I reached out to Lieutenant Mark Papanoff from the DNR. Um, he sent me a, a, an email. He said, this is actually a very common question and occurrence at times. He says, the posting of public lands as private by an adjacent landowner could either be intentional or accidental. Onyx or similar map, mapping systems will get you relatively close on property boundary lines. However, they shouldn't be used to determine the exact line. I did not know that. I had been relying completely on Onyx. He said Onyx and similar systems all have a degree of error, and more times than not, the actual property boundary is shifted and not exact. With that in mind, Lieutenant says, it's possible the adjacent landowner posted their property using an online mapping system accidentally, causing public land to be posted. Or it could have been done on purpose in an attempt to keep lawful recreators away from public land. In any case, according to uh, Lieutenant Mark Papadoff, the only legal way to determine the property line is by an official land survey. If the adjacent landowner isn't available to talk, 
The public can always contact a local DNR customer service center or a member of the Forest Service. Uh, the intentional posting, the intentional posting of another's property without permission is a misdemeanor and could result in up to 90 days in jail and a fine ranging from 100 to 500 as determined by the court. I thought Onyx was like the gospel. In fact, that's the way I've been using it. It is... It, it is, um, it's unfortunate to think that somebody would intentionally post public land as private and no trespassing, but you and I know it happens all the time, especially this time of year during the hunting season. Somebody's got a honey hole. They got a great spot. They don't want to share it with somebody else, even though it's public land, state land, whatever. Slap up some no trespassing signs. It's going to keep some people out. It's going to keep a lot of people out. Because think about this. Even if you have a very strong suspicion that this is public land, if you're not familiar with the area, if you want to avoid confrontation, if you don't want to get into a a fight with somebody, I think the average person, I think most people would say, you know what? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, so just to be on the safe side, I'm going to go find someplace else. And that's exactly what somebody who would be posting that land would want you to do. And I have a feeling that when this happens, more often than not, it is intentional and it's not accidental. Because the landowner knows where their property line is, right? They know where their property line, property line is. And I'm not saying, you know, something landowners would do. But there's, that, that's how to deal with it, according to Lieutenant Mark Papinaw from the uh, Michigan DNR, michigan.gov slash DNR. And Sam Sedinari, I appreciate you reaching out with your question. If you have a question for the Ask Avery segment, send me an email to mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com. That's mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com. I would love to hear from you. Let me know what's on your mind. Let me know if you have a question that you want uh, me to answer directly or... If there's something you would like me to reach out, if you have, you know, somebody that you want to direct to DNR or MUCC or something that I might have access to that you can't, send me an email. Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. Charlie, what does your clock say right now? Okay, gotcha. All right, we'll take a break for the top of the hour. When we come back in hour number three, a good friend of mine, Jerry Widener from the Hunter Safety System, These guys change the way we look at tree stand safety. No longer is it cool to go up a tree without a full body harness on. In fact, it's kind of crazy. So Jerry Widener and, of course, wild game chef extraordinaire Dixie Dave Miner all coming up in Hour 3 of this week's Outdoor Magazine. now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Mike Avery has covered the outdoors in Michigan for more than four decades, and that tradition continues today. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay Sporting Goods, the Yider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, Primal Outdoors, Security Credit Union, Offshore Tackle, Garber Chevrolet, Rapid River Knife Works, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction, and welcome to our number three of this week's Outdoor Magazine radio show here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network on kind of a, like, a really big weekend in the outdoors here in the great state of Michigan. Why is that, Avery? Well, because Sunday... Is or if you're listening on Sunday, was I mean Sunday's October first. What does October first mean? Well, it depends on who you are. It depends on the travels that you circle it. Uh, it travels the circles that you travel in. It might mean getting close to some great fall fishing. It might mean you're going to go cast some crankbaits for kings in the rivers on the west side of the state. It might be you're going to chase perch on Saginaw Bay. It might be you're going to chase muskies down on Lake St. Clair. It might be that you're squirrel hunting. It might be that you've got the dogs out in the grouse woods. 
Or it might mean the opening day of Michigan's bow season, October 1st. I don't know what the weather's going to look like. I mean, right now the forecast is for, eh, so-so. But, you know, does it really matter? Does it really matter what the weather is on the opening day of one of the deer seasons? Or is it just the fact that you want to be out there and take advantage of the opportunity and be a part of the history and tradition that is opening day? I will be out there opening day. I won't be out there in the morning. I'll be in church Sunday morning. But Sunday evening... Uh, My grandson, Trent, and I are going to go out and do some hunting. I will have a full-body harness on if I'm going up in a tree, and I think I will be going up in a tree. You know, they say there are two types of tree stand hunters, those who have fallen and those who will. Now, that might be an oversimplification, but I think it points it out that if you spend enough time climbing up trees, sooner or later something's going to happen. These days... I think I'd just soon be sitting in a ground blind if I have a chance. One of the primal uh, Wraith 270 see-through blinds. If I'm going to be up a tree, it's going to be a ladder stand. But even in a ladder stand, I'm not going to go up it without a full body harness on. I'm a big chicken when it comes to getting off the ground. I'm just a big chicken. But I'm also, I think, fairly well educated on this topic because for so many years, I worked with the guys at the hunter safety system. Hunter Safety System is the company that changed the way we look at tree stand safety. No longer is it cool or macho to go up a tree without a full body harness on. In fact, these days we look at it as being stupid. Hunter Safety System has gotten us to the point as hunters where when a young person now gears up to go hunting... They put on their full body harness just like they pick up their bow or just like they pick up their gun. It didn't used to be that way, but it is now. And I give much credit to the guys at Hunter Safety System. Hunter Safety System was started by three Michigan guys, John and Jerry Widener and their good friend, Jim Barsha, Jim Barta. I was lucky enough and blessed enough to be working with these guys almost from the beginning and became good friends with them, became great friends with them. And it's a real pleasure for me to have Jerry Widener, one of the big three of Hunter Safety System, on the Outdoor Magazine radio show this week. Jerry, welcome back to the show. How are you doing, buddy? Mike, I'm doing fantastic. I'm so blessed. And, uh, you know, I'm just hearing you talk and talking about the beginning. And you said near the beginning. Mike, you are the beginning. (laughs) When we were just getting started, um, we needed help. We needed guidance. We needed support. We needed somebody to get the message out. That was Mike Avery. And, um, <laughs> uh, you know, we still remember that, still appreciate that, and still love you for it. And, and hey, we're, we're still working together, so it's wonderful. Oh, uh, that's, that's nice of you to say, Jerry. I, I look at you guys, you know, if, if, if in our worlds we can find something that we have done good, we are blessed. But in your world, Jerry, what you guys have done is honestly save lives. And there's no, there's no debating it. You can't argue it. Hunter Safety System has literally saved lives by just being in business. What a tremendous honor that is. Mike, it's so humbling. I mean, it truly is. And I'm, I'm sitting here at my desk, and I'm looking at a box that I've kept over the years, and there's over 600 letters in that box unsolicited letters that people have written us saying, you know, I never thought it would happen to me, but yesterday it did. And your harness caught me, your lifeline caught me. And I just needed to thank somebody. And it's so humbling when we get that. And, and it's a tribute to all of us, Mike, it's a tribute to you. And it's certainly a blessing from God. And um, I want to, I want to say that I want to honor that because he put us in a position to be able to maybe affect people's lives. And it's, it's just a very humbling experience when it happens. How did it all come about? I mean, I, if, if I remember right, the, the impetus of the, of, of the product, the original product, was you and your brother John hunting here in Michigan. Yeah, that's exactly right. We were, we were hunting early days, and like a lot of people, found an excuse not to wear our harness. We had one that morning. He had one. I had one. We both tried to put them on that morning. Mine ended up upside down. John's ended up something similar, and 
we both made the decision to uh, forget this and climbed anyway. And that's the morning that John's climbing base fell out from under him. And he, by the grace of God, caught himself as he fell through on the climber portion, which that never happens, Mike. It just doesn't. You know that. I know that. But that day it did. And that was the start of it because when we finally got John to the ground, bleeding, exhausted, laying on the ground, both of us with our faces looking up to the sky, I said, John, why didn't you have your harness on? And he looked at me and said, were you wearing yours? (laughs) (laughs) He got you there, didn't he? (laughs) Boy, he got me. And that's where we decided that night is when we uh, got together in our camper where we were staying out in the woods in a camper. And uh, we drew up the plans for hunter safety system at that point. And and God's taken it from there. It's one of those things where when you look back on it now, you go, well, that is so simple. It's so basic. It's so obvious. Why was this not always the case? But when you first came up with it, it was really revolutionary. Yeah, it was. It, it really did change the way we looked at harnesses, the way we uh, um, thought about them, because prior to that, you just mentioned the word harness and you got a headache. Oh, yeah. It just, yeah. uh, it, it didn't go over well. And so we were able to maybe change that mindset that a harness doesn't have to be misery. It can honestly be comfortable. And if we'll think about it in that light, we'll stop using the excuses we have built into ourselves for not wearing them. And that was the whole idea and the concept of it. And thank goodness people started catching on, started realizing that, like you said earlier, Mike, it's 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 not the macho thing, you know, where at one point people didn't want to use it because it showed weakness in their mind. Ah, I don't need that. I'm a strong guy. Well, yeah, but more and more of us had experiences and loved ones that fell and injuries and deaths, you know, were happening. And they finally decided, you know what? That, that's that's silly when it's so preventable and so simple and so easy so comfortable today i need to i need to make it happen i w- i was talking in the earlier hour uh, in hour number two of the show about how hearing loss from shooting can almost always be prevented i think every tree stand fall could be prevented right i mean I- i'm trying to think of a scenario jerry where Oh, no, this was beyond our control, and this couldn't have been prevented. But if you have a full-body harness on, I don't care what happens around you, the fall can be prevented. You're not going to hit the ground. You're exactly right. And I think the one of the key ingredients to that over the years has been when we came up with the lifeline, where you could have a harness on, but you haven't attached it yet. Well, with the lifeline, it takes that excuse away also, because you attach at ground level, and never disconnect until you're back to ground level. So there's really never a scenario or an excuse that we could ever come up with to keep from hitting the ground. And it's so simple, so easy. They're cheap. They're used over and over again. They can be repeated. And it's, um, it's a system now that says we're silly if we don't do that. We truly are. I'm glad you brought up the lifeline because it is really a system, isn't it? And we'll talk more about this after the break. But but the, the lifeline is, I don't know, I think almost almost as important as the, the, the harness or the vest itself. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's part of the uh, complete pie now. And you you just don't you don't have a completion of that system until you have it. Uh, hang tight, Jerry. We've got to take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine show. We're talking with Jerry Widener of the Hunter Safety System, huntersafetysystem.com, huntersafetysystem.com. Hunter Safety System, uh, honestly, these guys uh, change the way we look at tree stand safety. No longer is it cooler to macho to go up a tree. I'm looking at their website right now, huntersafetysystem.com. They say saving lives is what we do. Now, that is a very strong, that is a very bold statement, but it's a true statement. It's been backed up by hundreds of people who have contacted Jerry Wider and said, look, you guys, I got to thank you because you've literally saved my life. I will not go up a tree without a full body harness on it, and it's going to be a harness from Hunter Safety System, uh, huntersafetysystem.com. I would encourage you as you're heading out in the woods this fall, look at it. If you don't want to do it, 
do it for somebody that you love because somebody's counting on you. HunterSafetySystem.com, Jerry Widener after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show on more than 30 radio stations across the great state of Michigan. And, of course, the podcast version of the show available anywhere, literally anywhere in the world. I always say the best way to listen, if you can, is on your local uh, AM or FM station, including WTCM in Traverse City. That's 580 AM. Over on the other side of the state, uh, in Tawas, WIOS, 1480 AM, 106.9 FM. You can hear the show twice each weekend on WIOS. And you can hear us in Port here on WPHM, 1380 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Reader Landscaping. Reader can take care of your lawn and property because it's your nature and our nurture. Let Reader create an outdoor getaway in your backyard as they have for me. But Reader's services go on, go far beyond just uh, uh, projects and, and making your backyard uh, look cool. They can also maintain your property. They can clean up your property. I'm thinking as now, as we're getting into the month of October, it is going to be time to clean up those leaves, to trim the trees, to uh, trim your uh, landscape and stuff. Reader can take care of that and so much more. It's going to be time to blow out your sprinkler systems. That's always at our, around our house. It's a, it's a sign of the fall. But something we hold off doing it because Reader has put a real nice uh, water feature in the backyard. And when the sprinkler systems gets closed down, the water feature goes away too. And if we're looking forward into that next season, you know, the one that follows <clears throat> this beautiful fall season. You know, that season that starts with W and it drops that white stuff out of the sky. Well, if you want Reader to take care of your s- 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 snow, they can do that as well. Check them out online at ReaderLandscaping.com. That's ReaderLandscaping.com. While you are online, please check out my website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com, and then head on over to HunterSafetySystem.com. HunterSafetySystem.com, obviously the website of the Hunter Safety System company. Jerry Widener is one of the guys who started Hunter Safety System. He is still actively involved today, and he's with us now on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. There's, Jerry, there, there are just there are so many things, so many directions that our conversation could go because we have such a a shared sense of camaraderie here and in some ways a shared sense of history here. But when I look at what you guys have done, I just, I've, I've got to go back to the way that you have saved lives and changed the way people look at the concept of tree stand safety. Yeah, I think the timing was probably good when we came out with it, Mike, because uh, full body harnesses hadn't been out long and just long enough for all of us to, develop a disdain for them, I guess, because <laughs> we all had that tangled mess at one point, and uh, that was probably just good timing on our part. You know, it's interesting, though. You know, the, the first hunter safety system vest was just that. It was a vest that was so easy to put on. When I look at your website now, huntersafetysystem.com, and I look at some of your new products, Jerry, they, they almost look like the old-fashioned harnesses, but I know they're built in such a way that they're still easy to put on. Yeah, you're right, because I know there's a, there's a new market over the last several years that have wanted to go lighter and lighter and more basic and people traveling deep into the woods or high up in the mountains or wherever, and they want as light as they can possibly get. So amazingly so, some of the models have turned back into almost the original, but we've been able to keep the same features of the hunter safety system, the simplicity of putting it on, the quick snap buckles, no dangling straps, um, and make still made it easy for people that are looking for that extreme lightweight. You've done so much research uh, over the years, too, in this whole topic, and you, you've come up with some things that, and the things that stick out with me is, once you get into your stand, you are statistically for the most part, fairly safe. It's the, it's the climbing up and down, and specifically that last step 
into and out of the stand. That's really where things are likely to happen, isn't it? Yeah, you're exactly right, Mike. That's that's the number one place where people are falling and mostly getting off of your stand. You know, getting onto and off are, are the main places where people are losing their balance or falling. And if you think about getting off of your stand, well, maybe you've been there for three, four, five, six hours. We're cold. We're stiff. We haven't been moving much. In fact, we haven't been moving at all because we're deer hunting. But now we're getting ready to stretch for the first time with stiff muscles, sore, soreness, and freezing cold, and we take that first step off, and that's when problems can occur. So that's the beauty of the lifeline, by the way, because you're connected. It doesn't matter. Even if you did fall, get back on it. Just get back on it and try again. You, you talk about the lifeline, and for people to understand, the lifeline is, is in its simplest sense – it is, a, a, it is a rope that is attached to the tree that you hook in your safety harness or vest to at the ground. You stay attached all the way up. You stay attached while you're hunting, and you stay attached back down. And as you said earlier, Jerry, if you do that, you can't fall. What I find interesting is, I, and I see this on some of the TV shows, they've got their lifeline hooked up there, and they talk about how safe they are. And I'm looking at it and going, you know, guys, you could do this differently because in my mind— as a guy who's used these forever, I think if you, I think you need to take that lifeline and actually put it higher up the tree than some of these guys are doing because some of these guys are hooking them up where they could actually fall and fall three or four feet before the lifeline would catch them. I think they need to set them up higher, Jerry. You're exactly right, Mike. I see that quite often. I do make a lot of phone calls to different people and different television shows who may be doing it in the fashion you just uh, showed that – they're not putting it up high enough. And the correct place to place it around the tree is as high as you can safely reach while standing in your tree stand. And if you do that, not only will it keep you from falling below your platform, but it also takes away any chance of your elbow getting caught in your tether as you turn to shoot. Mm, yeah, good point. Good point. So if, if you do fall... And you have the lifeline, you're not gonna you're not gonna fall far, right? You might you're gonna scare yourself. Man, are you gonna scare yourself? But then you've also got the problem, Jerry, of you're hanging there. How do you how do you get back into the stand or back on your ladder? What's the trick there? What's the secret there? You know, there's nothing that there's no textbook that says here's how to do it because every situation can be different. You know, are you out of a ladder? Are you out of a a climber? Are you in a, a fixed position stand? Um, did you fall to the right side, the left side, straight over the top? How far did you fall? So there's a lot of different scenarios where you can't just paint a broad brush and say, do it like this. But the key factor is if you're attached at the proper position, like you pointed out earlier, Mike, you're never going to have much of an issue because it's going to be very easy just to step right back on the platform because you're never going to have to get climb to get up on it just simply step out on it. You know, yep, you're going to panic for a second, and you might even smack against the tree pretty hard, but you're never going to hit the ground. Hmm. Just step back on it, continue. When you first came out with these, you guys owned the industry. You owned that segment of the industry. And if, uh, <clears throat> if imitation is a form of flattery, you should feel very flattered because over the years – Everybody now has come out with a hunter safety system-like product. The market's changed, hasn't it, Jerry? Yeah, it has a lot, and um, I guess that's, that's really the way to look at it. And I have tried to contact every new company that starts coming out with a harness to let them know that, you know what, you and I don't have to be enemies. And I don't look at you as competition as much as I look at you as maybe being able to save that life that I didn't get to for some reason. So I, I welcome them to the industry. I always make a point of going up and meeting them at places like the ATA show or SHOT show or, or different venues that um, you know about and I know about within the industry. And, uh, and I always try to help them. You know, if there's, a, if there's a way I can help you in this industry to make it happen, let's do it. Because you're after the same thing I'm after, and that's saving lives. Well, that says a lot about you right there. That they're not, they're not competitors. They're not, 
uh, somebody to trying to hurt their business. You're all in the same business together. That's pretty cool, Jerry. Well, it, it's right, though. I mean, just like our slogan you mentioned, saving lives is what we do. And if somebody else can help us do that, and it's through competition, I think that's where God would want me to be. So that's where I want to be. Hmm. Uh, looking back over the years, we've had so many <laughs> wonderful and fun hunts together. I, I kind of rode your coattails for a while because everybody wanted Hunter Safety System to come to come hunt their place. I mean, whether it was Ohio or whether it was Illinois or someplace else, and they, they'd invite you and you guys would invite me, and we had some wonderful hunts. What do you have uh, planned uh, for this fall, Jerry? Well, you know, I just got back from Kentucky where I didn't shoot. I got some great footage of some really nice bucks, uh, just chose not to. But things are different than they were back when we were first starting, Mike. You know, it's like I don't, I, I don't have to shoot one anymore, so uh, I'm just looking for the special deer. But I'm going to be leaving November 10th to go to Kansas. Oh, boy. I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, Kansas is such a, a unique place and special place for, for deer hunting. Um, and really outside of that, I guess I'm probably just going to be working. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it about time for you to start slowing down a little bit, my friend? <laughs> Everybody keeps telling me that, Mike. You know, I'm 70 now. Hit 70. Hit that magic m- number. Uh, but I, I enjoy going to work every day. Uh, it's, it's never a chore for me. So I'm, I'm going to do it as long as I'm able. And uh, right now I'm still able. And I'm gonna. I'm just gonna keep doing it. I I enjoy it. Oh, that's wonderful. That's what it's. It's. It is a true blessing to be able to do something that you love. I love what I'm doing, but I've never saved anybody's life like you guys have. What 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 a what a wonderful thing it is to say that you save people's lives and made hunting more enjoyable. Because when I'm up a tree with a full body hunter safety system harness on, I can relax and enjoy myself. And Jerry, I would encourage others to do the same. Well, I appreciate that, but Mike, you're absolutely wrong in the fact that you haven't saved people's lives in this regard. The people that you have reached that have heard you and seen you on your show when you had your television show have been influenced to go out and do that. They've been influenced to go out and buy that harness and wear it, and it's because of what they've seen and heard from you, even though you'll never know it, but you were the first part of that puzzle that made that happen, so... You need to know that. Um, Jerry, I appreciate that. Always a pleasure talking with you, my friend. I'll look forward to talking again in, in, the, uh, in the future, and our, I'm, I'm looking for our paths crossing again. In the meantime, I'll send people to the website, huntersafetysystem.com. Wish you a great season, and we'll talk again soon, my friend. Same to you, Mike. God bless you. Jerry Widener of the Hunter Safety System, huntersafetysystem.com. We'll take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine show. A few things I want to follow up on, and we'll wrap it all up with Wild Game Chef Dixie Dave Miner. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Ludington on News 9798, 98.7 WLDN. You can hear us uh, just down the road in uh, Muskegon on WKBZ, 1090 AM. And you can hear us on the other side of the state in Saginaw. News Radio 790 WSGW and 100.5 FM WSGW. I'm in the studios of WSGW right now. I'm in here with Charlie Root. Charlie's an interesting guy. He's been around the broadcast industry for a long, long time. And as a result, he has a lot of fans. And once again, as I look out the window, now this threatening rain right now. So the crowds aren't what they were, say, during the summertime when the kids were out of school. So there's only, uh, Charlie, maybe a couple dozen out there now. But they're anxiously awaiting you to uh, call it a day and head home so they can give you accolades as you're uh, driving out the... uh, driveway there and I, I appreciate your help as well charlie also appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk to jerry widener of hunter safety system honestly I and mean, you can probably get that sense just from hearing the conversation just a nice nice guy just a good all-around guy and the, the, my whole experience with hunter safety system was a very interesting one and to be honest with you one of the most rewarding um professional opportunities I think that I've had along the way. 
when when they came up with the hunter safety system, and you heard Jerry say it happened because his brother John fell, and they said we got to find a way to prevent uh, prevent this in the future. So they come up with this concept that at the time was real innovative. And now you look at it and go, well, that's just common sense. But they took these, these harnesses that you would try to put on to protect you when you go up a tree, and they'd just become a tangled mess. Well, they took one, and they sewed it into a vest. So all you had to do was just put the vest over your shoulders and clip it in front of you. I it, it mean, it seems it was a genius move at the time. But they didn't, they didn't know how to get the word out. At the time... I had a show, a TV show, the Outdoor Magazine TV show, that was on the Outdoor Channel. And these guys, Jerry and John and Jim, used to watch my TV show because they were Michigan guys too. They said, hey, we kind of like your style. We like what you're doing. And Jerry Widener called me out of the blue. They said, hey, my name's Jerry Widener from this new company called Hunter Safety System. We like your show. We've got a new product. We'd like to work with you. Are you interested? And, And honestly, I didn't know anything about it. Or anything about them. But I would have been foolish to say, no, I don't want to work with you. So we, we kind of pursued this back and forth and found out we had a lot of uh, common interests and common goals and common way of thinking of things and established a partnership with Hunter Safety System. And there was a time when they were the only people out there. Man, they were big. I mean, I looked at some of the old commercials the other day, and, and, and I don't know how I found myself in this situation. It's, <clears throat> um, oh, let's think, uh, uh, real tree. Uh, Michael Waddell was in their commercials. Uh, Greg Ritz was in their commercials. I'm trying to think of some of the other big, big names. And then there was Avery. <laughs> all these, all these top names, oh, the um, Lee and Tiffany, these top names in the world of outdoor television are in commercials wearing hunter safety system vests. And then this podunk guy from Michigan named Mike Avery comes along and he's wearing one too. <laughs> How did that all happen? <laughs> oh, I'm so glad I'm out of that world though. But it was, it was a wonderful experience, that, and, and it really opened my eyes again to the concept of tree stand safety. But some of these hunts we used to go on were just a riot. For many years, we went down and hunted Ohio with bill piles of Ohio bow hunting outfitters. In fact, in two weeks, roughly two weeks, no, just no, exactly two weeks, I'm heading back down there again. Uh, this time, my son James is going with us, my grandson Trent's going with us, and a few other friends of the Outdoor Magazine show are going as well. So, you know, we hunted Ohio, we hunted Michigan a couple times, we hunted Illinois. I mean, these guys, and like I said before, I was following their coattails. Everybody wanted a hunter safety system to come and hunt with them. And so they, you know, I was working with them and they would invite me along as well. I think we made it out to Kansas a couple times as well. Really an interesting, uh, an interesting relationship. And, And it turned into a true, true friendship. And that's the, light, uh, the type of, of, of business relationships I like, you know, where you can, just, you can sit down and have a cup of coffee and shake the hand of the people who own the company, who run the company, who make the decisions. You can establish partnerships, establish friendships that last for many, many years. Most of my business relationships have been in place for a long, long time. And that's the way I like it. I don't want to go jumping from company to company. I don't, I don't like that concept. I don't like it at all. So anyway, long story short, Hunter Safety System, one of, the, one of the most satisfying, gratifying business relationships I've ever had, partnerships I've ever had. And I think it boils down to the fact that these guys came up with a product that was a good product at the right time, and they actually saved lives. How many people can say that? HunterSafetySystem.com. That's HunterSafetySystem.com. We'll take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine show. When we come back, a conversation with another guy I've had a long time business relationship and friendship with as well. Wild game chef extraordinaire Dixie Dave Miner. He doesn't have the restaurant anymore, but he's still out there cooking. In fact, he's going to do our Trinity Monitor Wild Game Dinner and Auction coming up uh, first Saturday in March of 2024. I know that seems like a long ways off, but put it on your calendar. 
We'd love to see you there. My name is Mike Avery. The website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. The email address, Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. Love to hear from you. Don't hesitate to reach out. Dixie Dave coming up after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. Welcome back to Outdoor Magazine. I was thinking during the break about, you know, when I first heard from Jerry Widener and the Hunter Safety System, we got that whole thing going. At that point, I had already been working with wild game chef extraordinaire Dixie, Di- Dixie Dave Miner for a lot of years. Many, many years. You know Dave. He was on the old Outdoor Magazine television show for a long time. He had the uh, old Dixie Inn and Birch Run, and he had Oscar and Joey's. Um... And these days, he's living the good life. He's retired. He's got his feet up. He's looking out the window at the pond. He's watching the geese on the pond, and he's thinking, how can I cook those things up? <laughs> David, welcome back. How are you, buddy? Man, you hit the nail right on the head, Michael. <laughs> I couldn't have put it more eloquently than I, For some reason, I just had that image, and I thought, that's what Dave is doing. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah. Uh, Getting so, ready for catering. I got a wedding this weekend. Oh, a wedding. Really? Where's that going to be, Dave? In Clio. Nice, nice, nice. And then you've got the uh, fundraiser for Michigan Out of Doors at, uh, and Delta coming up too, right? Right, right. You should attend that, Michael. It's going to be a fun time. Well, I don't, I don't, I, I'm sure it will be a good time. I don't want to encroach on their event, but I'm sure it'll be a good time. When, when and where, Dave? Give us the details if you got them. Um, it's at uh, the Frank and Ruth Gun Club, the Conservation Club, and it's October 16th. And if you call Delta College and ask for Gwen, she'll get you some tickets. Oh, nice. Now, 16th, I will be in Ohio on a hunt, but I remember the Frank and Ruth Conservation Club. We've done a, events there before. Yes, we have. Hmm. Numerous. What do you have for us, before I talk us all out of our time, what do you have for us this week, Dave? Well, we've got a, uh, a partridge recipe, and uh, this is one you can use the whole birds with instead of just the breast meat. And you skin them, skin them and uh, make sure you get all of the, the shot that's driven into the animal, uh, the feathers and the bloodied meat out. And you want to cut it in thirds, so you're going to have a breast and a leg and a thigh attached to each one. So you need three carrots, chopped cores, kind of almost stew-sized pieces, an onion, same thing, uh, two stalks of celery, a package of mushrooms, um, three to four garlics, whatever you like. Uh, however your your family or your diners would uh, enjoy garlic. I like a lot of garlic, so I would probably put four cloves in. You need two jars of chicken gravy, a couple ounces of a white wine. Whatever you're drinking with this meal, you know, Chardonnay or um, whatever it is, you know, or a Riesling, you can use this in cooking. You need about an ounce, an ounce, ounce and a half of Jack Daniels. And if you don't have any of that bourbon, just any bourbon will do. A couple ounces of heavy cream, a little salt and pepper to taste, and tarragon to taste, whatever your family likes, uh, some flour and olive oil. So what you're going to do, after you get all of the bloodied meat and the shad that drove in the feathers, you want to dredge the meat in flour. And then a small amount of oil, you want to brown it all on all sides. When you get it done, don't crowd it. You know, it might take you two or three, four batches, you know, but then place it in an oven-proof pan. And then you can add the carrots, celery, onions, and mushrooms. And you want to saute that up. You might have to add a little more oil. You know, stir it kind of constantly. It's only going to take you a few minutes to start to break that flavor loose. Then you can add the white wine and the Jack Daniels. And it shouldn't flare up too much at all because you, uh, you've got all them vegetables in there. Add the tarragon at this point because you didn't want to burn it by stirring it up. You want to reduce this volume by about half and then you can add the chicken gravy the salt and pepper to taste and then uh, put the heavy cream in it over the top of the uh, birds and then uh, make it at 350 degrees stirring it once in a while you know and you can bake it uncovered for at least an hour maybe an hour uh, 15 or 20 minutes if you was to make uh, white rice or wild rice with this, that would go just great. It's a killer way to use the bird, the whole bird, and uh, 
I like it. Mm. It's been a long time since I've had uh, uh, grouse. Is it? Is it? Um, is it lighter than goose? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Way, way, way lighter. Yeah. Yeah. There's no comparison. So, goose is a real dark meat, almost like venison colored, and this is kind of uh, cream colored. Like uh, pheasant? That. Like pheasant? Uh, even lighter than pheasant. Ah, okay. Okay. It's very delicate. Well, and, and I'm thinking there's not a lot of meat on one of those things, but a lot more than you can find on a woodcock, that's for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. And woodcock is one of the meats that's real dark, too. Woodcock is more like uh, goose, isn't it? About three times the size of a woodcock you're going to get out of the breast. Hmm. Well, David, listen, always a pleasure. I appreciate you joining us. Um, bow season starts Sunday of this weekend. When when will you be out in a stand for the first time? Probably Monday. I'm going to be cleaning up after that catering on Saturday night, so we probably won't get in the woods till Monday. Well, good luck to you. Have fun, and we'll talk to you again next week. Well, thank you, Michael. If you do get a chance to get out or go with the grandkids, have a good time and be safe. I will do that. You as well, my friend. Wild Game Chef extraordinaire Dixie Dave Miner, a big part of the Outdoor Magazine show, as are you, because if you weren't listening, there'd be no reason to do the show. There'd be no reason to do the live streams. There'd be no reason to do the podcast, anything else. And I don't know what I would do with myself. My name's Mike Avery. The website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. MikeAveryOutdoors.com. The email address, Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. I'm also very active on social media. I do live streams every Wednesday morning at 845 from the Outdoor Magazine radio studio. And I do live streams called the Wednesday Night Live. How original is that? Every Wednesday night at 7 on my social media outlets as well. Uh, If you're getting out there, do like Dave says. Have fun. Be safe. And I will talk to you next time right here on Outdoor Magazine.